observatories on the moon, and art that reaches orbit. You're listening to Are We There Yet? The radio show exploring space exploration. Hi, I'm Brendan Byrne. Another commercial moon lander is launching this week from Kennedy Space Center. The lander is bringing payloads from NASA and commercial companies to the moon, including a set of cameras to turn the moon into an observatory. We'll speak with one astrophysicist about these new plans for the lunar surface. Then space isn't just about science, it's also about art. A space art and poetry contest allows submissions from students and educators for a chance to get their work into orbit. We'll speak with two astronauts about how they are using art to inspire the next generation of space enthusiasts. That's ahead on Are We There Yet? A commercial lunar lander from Intuitive Machines is launching on SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket this week. And on that mission is a technology test that will lay the groundwork to establish an observatory on the moon. The lunar environment gives astronomers advantages they don't have on Earth, like less atmospheric and radio interference. Here to talk more about astronomy on the moon is astrophysicist Anna Mascara. Anna, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Brandon. Yes, this is going to be a fun conversation um, about setting up an an observatory on the moon, right? Um, that's the end goal. Um, tell me about why this is so important. Oh, well, it's important because it's going to open, I think, that a new frontier for astronomy. Um, we are sending this uh, first to tiny cameras that were developed uh, in Canada by Canada's Aerospace. And this is our precursor mission, right? It's going to be to test a lot of technology um, and to test how we're going to work out the observations so that our next mission, that it's going to be observations and communications, you know, we, we, we can learn from, for that one that is coming in probably one or two, two years. And, and, why is an observatory on the moon so important? We've got plenty of observatories here on Earth. There's a few in space. Uh, why do you want to put one on the lunar surface? Well, the moon is just extremely, extremely special, right? For radio astronomers, it's like heaven, literally heaven, because you don't have all the interference that you have. Uh, you know, like as humans, we produce a lot of, of radio that inter would interfere with the with the observations. Uh, and especially like right, if you're on the far side, you will not have all of that. And also from the moon, um, you don't have the atmosphere. So if you don't have the atmosphere, you also can reach out to other wavelengths um, that we cannot from Earth. And that will allow us, for example, to observe the dark ages of the universe um, from there. Um, it's also great because you can build bigger observatories there uh, due to the gravity conditions um and also like in, in on the moon you have like these craters that are permanently shadow in which uh you can put certain instruments that are for example the infrared ones are particularly sensitive to heat so there you have like the permanent shadow regions that will show them um for example there the big monster the jwst has to be really careful about that and you have like this shield in um and so those are some of the advantages um and i think that personally and you know as an astronomer as a, as someone that loves exploration um as you said uh, when we were chatting before uh, it's so cool just to to think about <laughs> right to think about humans on the moon and then well as an astronomer the will be a dream come true how observatories on the moon yeah, uh, but yeah, that's, that's all the science. <laughs> well, as a non-scientist, I, I will take the argument that it's cool. Um, I would agree with you. It's cool. <laughs> so you like it, it is it is really neat. Like cause you're essentially the plan is to make the moon its own radio telescope, right? Putting it in those in those craters and, and keeping it nice and cold. I mean, that's that's really fascinating, right? Well, yes, this is what you know, like this um Let's go to do the mission that we are so excited. This is like at, at the same time and very few days, finally, to go to Florida to see the launch. But this, uh, this mission in particular, um, it's uh, from the International Lunar Observatory Association, and they are based in Hawaii. And uh, as the name says, they're very international. That's one of the main goals in both everyone uh, from all backgrounds, right? The public, that's, that's the main goal of the International uh, Lunar Observatory Association. Um, and um, the mission on the machines uh, will uh, will be like these tiny optical cameras 
that uh, actually are going to take the first images of the Milky Way in the 21st century and are the first uh, Hawaiian cameras. Um, so we want to expand the understanding of the cosmos from the moon. And this also is going to open like a new dimension for astronomy in Hawaii that you know they have also already there they have like these amazing observatories, right? So this is the goal of ILO A, expand the, the understanding of the cosmos from the moon. These first cameras um, that are Hawaiian and taking the first optical images of the Milky Way galaxy. So you talked about how these cameras that are going on on intuitive machines are, are the precursor. There will be follow-up missions. Um, intuitive machines is now the second commercial lunar lander to launch this year almost um you know you know is it because of these commercial partnerships that have opened up all of these opportunities for science and these observatories like you're discussing like could you would this be possible without the commercialization of sending things to the moon i i mean the commercialization opens like this um this new opportunity of uh, you know um trying to start to build these observatories from the beginning i think that we'll have to wait a little bit further developments because you need to current like the instruments and everything right uh, our goal is to send from the beginning demonstrates that it is possible to start doing uh, mm. some astronomy and this mm. is only possible because uh, actually like the, the mini miniaturization of the cameras uh, that was done by Canadenses, and that allows you actually to be part of these initial uh, missions in which you are a bit limited by the by the size and by the power. Um, so I think that yes, it is only possible because uh, of this. But also the technological advances that you described of making things smaller and also having more frequent rides to the to the moon, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that certainly, I mean, the key aspect of the mission is this uh, advancements that um, the company did uh, because actually the cameras are extremely light and the engineers work around all, all the technology needed like to survive with the, what, where power you may have available there um, and also like in the harsh environment that it's... It's the moon. You mentioned a, a few of the reasons why the moon is great for this. You, you talked about um, there's there's not a lot of radio uh, interference. Um, as somebody who works for an FM radio station, I apologize for that. Sorry about that on Earth here. Um, you, you mentioned that there's you know there's no atmosphere, so it's it's a really great place for you to have this observatory. It can get very cold if you need it to be for your instruments. But this this is specifically going to the south pole of the moon, right? Um, why is that so interesting? Um, to you and in, in your research? Well, I mean, the South Pole is, is very interesting because um, water has been found by Sophia Observatory before. So that's where we expect that uh, most of the lunar activity could start to be developed, right? So, um, and based upon that, that's a, that's a great location to be uh, from the astronomical point of view. And also because uh, Aloy A, um, one of the objectives are communications and broadcasting. And so whenever uh, we have like an, an ecosystem uh, going on there, as uh, just to, to transmit. Can, can you talk a bit about the, that broadcasting and communicating, right? How, how is that going to work and, and what challenges exist in, in communicating to something that's, you know, something like, a, you know, 240, 250,000 miles away from us at any given time? <laughs> that would be like the aloe worm that it's, uh, it should be developed and we need to, to first uh, learn from the precursor and to validate these technologies to actually make like a, a more uh, accurate uh, the description of, of, of those plants. Uh, but uh, yes, that's uh, one of the ideas that we will have uh, for the next upcoming missions. Gotcha. Let's let's chat a bit about that uh, the precursor. Um, tell us tell us a bit about. So this launches hopefully this week, and Intuitive Machines makes its trip to the moon. Then what? Uh, what happens uh, next? Well, if all goes as expected, uh, as, as I described very briefly before, uh, we're expecting to get the, the images of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and and uh, that's important, we believe, from the societal point of view, because it's going to be like uh, extremely inspiring as the images of the, you know, the first images of the Earth's rise. So that's the legal part so that, that we made. Um, and uh, and then, of course, we expect to be doing um, some science from the images that we take. We're uh, 
our priority is the Milky Way galaxy and then some images of, of the sky um, and also the images of the surrounding areas uh, about the lander are going to be taken and I will also get DVDs as well as that some things I expect to be deploy or from other payloads and they get images of that um and then get the images and um analyze and how how quickly do you expect this this uh tech demonstration to be up and running when will we see these images of of the milky way if all goes well on launch and deployment well, well i don't know i don't know exactly when uh the images uh, are going to be shared but we are expecting that to be um very soon um, and I, I just want you to reflect on this because, um, I mean, you are launching a payload um, to the moon this week. That has got to be incredible. <laughs> what is it like to know that something you worked on is heading to the moon? Um, no, no, that's actually a fun astronomer. It's, uh, it's, it's incredible. Like the cameras, um, as the cameras per se, are, are at a humble instrument, right? Because once again, this is the precursor. Um, but uh, I think that the whole team, uh, it's, it's a bit shocked right now <laughs> with a, a lot of emotions uh, and everything. But uh, yes, um, once again, this will open like a new dimension and um, beyond, you know, like the, the images, what we want is to, to foster curiosity about science um, and, and to inspire people uh, about the prospects of uh, living on the moon, being on the moon, doing astronomy from the moon. Um, so that's why we are uh, all excited about. <laughs> astronomy from the moon. Did you ever think that that would be something that you would say in your career? Doing astronomy from the moon? So I think that I had thought about it, that, that you're going to do astronomy from the moon come from the from centuries ago, like the, like the imagination. Of, of doing the things right uh, so I think I have thought about it I wasn't sure that perhaps as I would see it in my, in my lifetime or something like that um, but you know we have like these big telescopes already in, in space that are like you know uh, giants big monsters that are, uh, allow us to learn a lot about the universe so um, with all the developments in commercial and these new partnerships Say that yes, um, yes. <laughs> well, well, Anna, I am I am so excited for you and your team uh, to to see this launch and see this tech deployment. Um, let's have you back on when we when we get those images back and and let's chat about it. But but for now, thank you so much for joining us and uh, best of luck with your mission. Thank you so much, Brandon. That was Anna Mosquera, an astrophysicist working with the International Lunar Observatory Association. Still to come. Space art. Every young person has a voice in them that is telling them what to lean toward. We think art is so fundamental to design, it needs engineering. Before someone can invent, engineer, develop, they have to first imagine. That's ahead on Are We There Yet? You're listening to Are We There Yet? I'm Brendan Byrne. On this show, we've had several astronauts who've incorporated their art into their trip to space, including Chris Hadfield and Nicole Stott. Now, astronauts John Schaffner and Peggy Whitson are serving as judges in the International Space Art and Poetry Contest, Take Two. They both flew aboard the Axiom 2 mission, and before her time at the company, Whitson was a NASA astronaut who has spent a cumulative 675 days in space more than any other American or woman. Their contests allow students and educators to submit their art for a chance for it to be flown into space. Here to talk more about what it's like to help inspire space artists is John Schaffner and Peggy Whitson. John, Peggy, welcome to the show. Yeah, it's awesome to be here with you again, Brendan. Uh, how are you? I'm, I'm great, John. Good to see you again. And Peggy, welcome to the show. It's your first time here. Uh, glad to chat with you. Yeah, no, this will be fun. This was a, a great event last year on orbit and uh, looking forward for a repeat. Uh, John, let, let's start with this this new iteration of of the um, the contest. Tell us a bit about um, what you've learned from from the first contest and, and how you're applying it to, to this next one. 
Yeah, it was it was it was really amazing. You know, of course, the inspiration for this, you know, was the the A in STEAM, and and that's really important to be inclusive of the arts and the uh, the, the design and concept of what what is in all of us, and particularly in young children. Uh, you know, I had that experience when I was growing up. I liked art, and I drew some space stuff. So doing it in orbit last year, we got uh, such a huge response, not just in numbers, but in quality of art. Over 900 from entries from 26 countries, and the the art was simply amazing, and the poetry as well. And and John, what was the reaction from um, some of the contest winners? I know they got to see their their art in space, which I have got to imagine is just absolutely incredible. If 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 you're a young kid um, who really put a lot of passion in, into their entry, what was what did you hear from them? Well, Brendan, today if you went into a class, a fourth grade class at ten year olds, you're looking at young people that in 20 years will be running the country and will be uh, doing the things that drive our planet forward, including taking humanity to space. So bringing that awareness into today's world, into the young mind today, that space is here. You know, we are back in the space world environment, you know, for for good. So instilling that in them. And the, the amazing thing that we noticed from last year was they already had such vivid thoughts and understanding of what space could be that driving that further into today's world for them to think about on a regular basis is what we're trying to do to get them to take up the challenge of what space would be like. The, the next iteration, um, you're asking students and educators around the world to to um, to show what it would look like if we lived in space. Um, Peggy, I'm going to ask for a, a hint on this because um, I know you've set a record for living in space. <laughs> uh, what What do you think uh, uh, some some folks should take as, as inspiration for for this prompt? What, what What would you do? Oh, what would I do? Hmm. Oh, I think you know the trying to capture the vastness of space is really challenging. Uh, what inspired me about last year's uh, uh, app, you know the projects that they submitted was that they just came from such a diverse range. Uh, I loved seeing, you know, how young people thought we would be living in space, whether there'd be, you know, vehicles on a planet or you're floating in space uh, in, in a station or something like that. All of that was really unique and inspiring. I I, I don't know that I can do as good a job uh, from an arts perspective of trying to capture all that um, but I, I really was impressed with their with the submissions. And I think that's, you know, what John and I want to, you know, promote is actually that creativity, that new thought process. Because John and I have talked about it before, you know, art leads tends to lead engineering. And so those creative ideas give engineers new ideas. Well, how would you make that happen? And so it it's a great uh prelude to what we can be gone. Are you a creative yourself, Peggy? Oh, as a kid, I drew some. I wasn't, uh, you know, not particularly creative. I did do some poetry as a kid. I, I would say I haven't done anything in my recent past. No, I've been a little preoccupied doing some other things. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. John, John, we have talked about this before and, and how you know important that art is in, in STEAM. Um, what is your end goal with initiatives like this international space art and, and poetry contest and some of the other things that, that you have done uh, in your outreach efforts? What do you want to change? Yeah, well, we're, we're always looking for avenues to expand. You know, like this year, we've expanded to an educator's category. So you want to see what teachers might also, you know, choose to put forward as creativity. And and Peggy, you I mean, with your work with with Axiom, you're you're kind of on the forefront of of this this new chapter of of space exploration where there is um, a lot more happening in the commercial world and a lot more opportunities for people, for more people to get into space. Um, how important is it in in promoting that that artistry, that creative spirit, um, when it comes to this new chapter, these are not just, you're not just looking for people that are, are builders and engineers, right? What aspect of creativity is going to have on the future of, of commercial space exploration? Actually, that's a great, great question, Brendan, because uh, we do want to inspire people about 
the beauty of space, about the opportunities, the, the everything that exists out there. Uh, so it's it's really exciting to be um, a part of this process of, of expanding the ideas and taking their art and showing it off to give people even more inspiration. You know, I, I've talked to, to quite a few astronauts in the past about art um, and and doing art in orbit. Um, we've spoken with uh, NASA's Nicole Stott, who did some watercolor painting while she's up there. Um, Canada's Chris Hadfield, who uh, who famously did some music. Um, what is the importance of, of having those kind of creative creative outlets um, when you are on the space station or, or living so far away from your friends and family down on Earth? Well, I think from a psychological perspective, it's great to have hobbies and and distractions, if you will, to maybe not focus on so much on the fact that you're away from family and friends, but to focus on the where you are and what you're living and what you're experiencing and how do I convey this to other people. I think that's really a, a special way of um, articulating some of that uniqueness of being in space. Well, for sure. You know, it's, uh, you know, you can have a hobby, you know, but we don't want to have it just earth-based hobby. You know, we, we, we like to think that every young person has a voice in them that is telling them what to lean toward. And uh, we think art is so fundamental to design. Like Peggy mentioned that a moment ago, it leads engineering. Before someone can invent, engineer, develop, they have to first imagine. And the very basis of imagination starts with the arts and how we put things together from our mind's eye. And to teach young people how to express their inner thoughts or their visions, put it on a piece of paper, expand that thought, you know, that's, that's another part of what this, uh, things like this can do to bring their thoughts forward. John, let's talk a bit about the, uh, the, the mission plan for this contest, uh, as it were. Um, tell us a bit about how, how students and, and kids and educators can get in, involved in this and, and what they need to do if they want to submit their artwork. Yeah, you bet. We're excited. Um, it's uh, they can find all the all the work that they need, all the information on uh, the website spaceartcontest.com. Uh, the contest opens uh, February five, it closes April five. Uh, so it's open to three main ca- four four categories, three for students, you know, five to five to eight, nine to thirteen, and fourteen to eighteen, plus an educators conf- uh, uh, category. Yeah, that's art, drawn art or painted art, uh, or poetry. So if you have, if you don't feel comfortable drawing, but you have great words in your head, let us hear what you think about space. Um, mm-hmm. They sub- submit that, submit those digitally through the website, and then we'll uh, we go from there, making selections. So, so John, you're, you 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 both aren't doing this alone, right? Can you tell us a bit about the the partners that are that are working with you on this program? It, it would not be practical for one person to try to do this. It really does take a community of of folks to make this possible. Something like this involving space. So we have a uh, great collaboration with the ISS National Laboratory, who's helping us uh, create the pathway to do this with Axiom Space, with Limitless Space Institute, supporting this technically, uh, and Crayola Experience, who's one of our partners. Um, that along with getting it to orbit and in the hands of some fine NASA astronauts who will exhibit it on orbit for us and take some pictures and speak to the event and make the awards. So. Uh, it, it's a whole cadre of great uh, people uh, supporting something that we think is very valuable and getting young minds uh, thinking more about their role in space. Gotcha. And, and Peggy, uh, along with with John and a few others, you're, you're going to be one of the um, the judges on this. Um, last year, you received over 930 submissions. <laughs> are, are you excited <laughs> to go through all of that art? That sounds like a daunting task. <laughs> It, it, it actually really is because they're so beautiful. And, you know, I just was so impressed with the creativity. That does make it very, very challenging as part of the selection process. And uh, it, it's nice to have a team of folks so that, you know, if, if uh, multiple people see something special or unique about a particular piece of art, we can, you know, give it a little more priority and bump it up because it's hard. And I guess finally, you know, to both of you, you know, what do you want the message to be? Um, what are you hoping that that these these students learn from from this experience, even if they're they're not selected? Yeah, well, the the you know one of the first things is, is just to get them to think 
and to think about space, think about the possibilities, and then think about themselves. Where do they see themselves in any of those future possibilities? You know, what there's so many career paths that touch on space and aerospace, and then the future of taking humanity to space. The main push here is just to get young people thinking about the possibilities for themselves. Peggy, anything to add to that? Oh, oh, yeah. I just think it is so interesting, you know, even, you know, cur- currently at Spaceflight, I would, I was looking, I was visiting where they were building some of the, the spacesuits one time, and I met a young gal who was doing the heat sealing of the inner bladder, the, the uh, pressure type uh, bladder that protects you while you're out in the vacuum of space. And I asked her, well, what, what's your degree in? And she said, fashion design. And I just think it's really cool to think about that there are so many jobs out there that you might not even realize are associated with space, uh, whether you know whether or not you actually end up there or you're just uh, building parts and pieces and contributing to that process, to that technology. Fascinating stuff. Well, Peggy, John, thank you so much for joining us. Peggy Whitson, John Schaffner are judges in the International Space Art and Poetry Contest, um, along with a ton of other accolades um, and also have uh, our, our veteran astronauts visiting the International Space Station. Peggy, John, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you, you Brendan. Pleasure. And as I mentioned at the start of that conversation, this is not the only time we've talked about the connection between space and art. Be sure to visit the show's website at WMFE.com org slash are we there yet we'll link to some of our favorite conversations uh, including a conversation we had with john when he was on the international space station for the first version of his international space art and poetry contest where we actually got to see some of that art floating around in the international space station i've also got a great conversation with chris hadfield about transitioning to fiction writing and also conversations with veteran nasa astronaut nicole stott about how she's using art to connect us to a better world. Visit our website, wmfe.org slash are we there yet. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you're not already, be sure to subscribe to the show's podcast feed so you never miss an episode. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Now we're even on YouTube or do it wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, if you could rate and review us, that helps us get to more ears. You can also follow us on social media channels, including Instagram. We're at AWTY space. Are we there yet? Space. Get it? And we got more space coverage on online, visit WMFE.org slash space. Are We There Yet? is a production of 90.7 WMFE News. Our producer is Marion Summerall. Our intern is Emily Ching. And editorial guidance comes from LaToya Dennis. Support for Are We There Yet? comes from our listeners. Until next week, I'm Brendan Byrne. Thanks for listening.